Okay, okay then, mate. Well, let's get going. <clears throat> Had your tea. Oh, what flavour tea was it? Was it normal? <laughs> uh, I don't know what's happening right now. <laughs> what <are you> doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's great. That um, must be one good cup of tea. Bonjour, Chris. Hey. Yes. <laughs> yes, welcome. Welcome, Chris. Hey. Uh, Thanks for having me on, Red. No problem at all. Longbox Punk, aka. That's welcome. me. Yep. Welcome That's, to the uh... channel. We are gonna we've had well, we've had one really, really long conversation about music. Yeah. That is your kind of is it your other passion or your main? If you was um, gonna picture them, comic. If I, it, yeah, if I had to put it I'd probably comics would probably be first, but like oh. just barely above yeah, the music. Yeah, the, yeah. Um, Excellent. Yeah, I I mean I grew up with both, so uh, it's it. hard to really separate them. So that's why the long box punk thing just made sense because it was two things that I feel like I could talk about for hours with, and you and I have, and yes, uh, here we are about to talk comics for who knows how long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, know, who, who knows? And that's a great name, by the way, Long Box Punk. Thank and you. all your links, give me all your links and they'll all be put on there and people can chase you up. Yeah. And, uh, listen, I was listening to your two-tone on Punk 911 oh, yeah. podcast and yeah. all great stuff. Great yeah. stuff. Thank so you. We are here to review March's output. Mm -hmm. And as the guest, let's dive straight in. Ooh, in no right. particular order, Chris, Yeah, uh, like we discussed. So what would you like to, to kick off March's comic book heaven with? <laughs> so I'm actually going to start with the ending of a series. Um, I've been a big fan of... This Gargoyles Dark Age, um, yeah. you know, Greg Wiseman is back. And so he's the the guy behind the show that um, so many of us were just hooked on as kids. And so when he initially, when they relaunched with Dynamite, he did, you know, he came back, I think it was a 12 issue initially. And then he had said several places, like, I have a lot of stories still to tell with the Gargoyles. And oh. I'm really happy that dark ages was one of them because it goes back to when the clan was first connecting with the uh the english folk that you know built the castle that and then eventually gets moved to new york city by xanatos you know two thousand years later um and so it's it's been great because i love medieval stuff anyway yeah. and so i'm seeing a lot of like the medieval knights and there's castles and fiefdoms and just the the um the clashing that's happening between the gargoyles and the humans initially and like the the tension that's there anyway um just they really leaned into it and kind of set up the ground of it's basically a prequel to the gargoyles series oh, um, nice. issue six is the last of this one and then they set up there's a new one that's going to be coming in uh actually it just started uh the last week of march um where they're starting another new spin-off that he is going to be telling uh with a different artist so uh it just it's so much fun like it, the gargoyles for me is just it's so nostalgic to just like yeah. sit in and it's great to see different aspects of the characters because in the cartoon right goliath was always the leader fearless, confident, all the things. And it's a classic trope. Like, think of the Thundercats, which I'm going to get to next, um, which is why they go back to back. There's some thought here. Um, but it's... In New York, he was very much... He had the confidence. He had the know-how and the... You know, he had the plans and he knew what to do. And in Dark Ages, because it's kind of the setting the stage for everything that's to come, he's very much like the youngling. And they really... He's not a major character in this story and i kind of like that because there's i feel like every other gargoyle had their own story and this one got to explore a little bit more of hudson who's like the old wise man um and so he's really featured prominently which i liked 
And then even like Lexington, Broadway and Brooklyn are like tiny tots in this one. Like they're basically toddlers that are running around as new hatchlings and they're making friends with the human children as well. So like seeing them play together and then seeing Gargoyle and uh, Desdemona's love for each other and like their relationship is just blooming. So he's basically a teenager. And then seeing Hudson being the wise old man working with the humans uh, was just really, it's just really fun. Oh, it's wow. really fun. I like, I, it's great. <laughs> And do you have to, is it, and, and this, you know, it's not, um, it doesn't make it a bad thing, but is it set up for fans of the cartoon or can, could a new read like me, Gargoyles pass me by? When, when, when are we talking, 90s? Yeah, early, like 90 something to, yeah, early, early to mid 90s was the yeah, cartoon. Yeah, so there's yeah. a kind of period there where, I'm getting married in the early nineties and buying my first house and having my first kid and certain, you know, certain things will just pass you by. Yeah. yeah. Gargoyles is one of them. So would it be a book that I can pick up and get it or have you gotten, and I don't mean this, like I say, it's not a trick question or yeah. is it just purely for the fans of the show? I, as a fan of the show, I appreciate some of the things that they put in as like a, a love letter to the fans yep. i don't think you need to be a fan to oh, pick cool. up once the trade comes out yeah. um you no, can like pick this up on its own and still get a really cool medieval gargoyle human tale yeah. i like so, a lot yeah. because i i picked up maleficent uh yeah. by the same kind of uh, you know it's the same publishing kind yep. of area yep. and I, I thought that was really good so um that, that's one that i i saw and i was just like i just don't have the capacity to, <laughs> to pick this up um but maybe once the trade comes out i'll snag it and let the wife read it and then i can check it out yeah, at the same it, time. it was good i just got a soft spot for that character but um but actually you sound about greg wiseman yeah he my first choice he wrote how about that greg wiseman really? and I, and that wasn't even planned was it wow no as you, it, as you said it, I thought, oh, this is this is good. It makes us look slick. <laughs> right. We <laughs> planned this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this, so Spectacular Spider-Men, Chris, mm -hmm. I've seen this in the shop, and the first thing is Humberto Ramos on the artwork, and I thought, and Spider-Man has not been cheering me up recently under Zeb Wells' cheerilage, uh, and it's the first time in my life I've ever dropped a Spider-Man title. I've, I've left, I've had to leave it due to life so when you when you can't physically uh, and financially collect comics you you just yeah, don't yeah. get spider-man and etc cetera, etc cetera. but other than that this is the the latest spider-man is the first time i've just gone no no more no more so this mm -hmm. one i thought right this one looks good but where it says men i thought it was just spectacular spider-man yeah but it's miles morales as well so it's Peter Parker, Miles Morales, and I've got to say, Greg Wiseman's quippy, thwippy dialogue with the action all the way through, and it's just a day in the life of, in a way, story. Yeah. So they're just fighting some random, I forget the name of the green monster in it, but, but it's more to do with the day-to-day -day of Miles and Peter's lives and it was such a solid first issue. When you compare it to the ultimate Spider-Man that comes up, nothing wrong with it, by the way, nothing wrong with it. Yeah. But where that was quite a, and, and you know, you're going to expect that from Hickman, an elevated kind of lofty ideals kind of thing. This, I've got to say, I just thoroughly enjoyed. It, because it was unexpected, I thought, oh, Oh yeah, there's two of them, Spider Man. Oops. So perhaps it was a little bit me, uh, not realizing <laughs> what it was about. It was a very, very easy read. From what you're saying about Greg Wiseman and his writing, it seems like he can he can pull off the light hearted mm -hmm. Spider Man, but without being silly. Yeah. Which is yeah. what's going wrong with the main the main Spider Man's getting too jokey, and although this was this was quite quick quick witted dialogue, um, but, but it was between the two of them, which means they're friends. It doesn't make it silly. Yeah. 
Whereas in the main, anyway, I really enjoyed that. And I reckon that's going to be, for the time being, because we can never tell with Marvel, because they're, they're not very consistent with their their creative teams. They seem to just bounce around. They seem to get a winning team nine times out of ten and, and just go, oh, yeah, we'll be getting another artist on that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's time to keep it fresh. So that's it. Yeah, yeah, that's... And, yeah. Or the artist, you know, wanted holiday or whatever. Yeah. Yep. Or got a gig doing something else that earning more money. I don't know what goes on. <laughs> right. And I think that is a lot to do with it. But that's Probably. a subject for another day. Right. That's yes. I, yes. I, so I, go on, go on, Chris. What's your next choice? All right. So sticking with uh both dynamites and um shows that i loved as a kid uh thundercats yes the second issue i did pick up one of the variants um because come on that's so good it's got them all there um i love there he is there's my guy tigra has the full like the full handlebar mustache this time yeah and it and at first i was like that's an interesting choice because he always just kind of seemed like a pushover in the cartoon and even in the old like in the original series comics um he was always just kind of there and this time when i saw the mustache i was like "Ooh, maybe yeah. they're gonna give him more of like an edgy like hard you know per- personality and it's kind of playing out that way um it's got declan chalve i'm probably saying that wrong and drew moss um as the creative team on this. And I believe they're on for at least the first like two arcs of this run. So because I'm the same way. I like, if I find a creative team that works, get just, I want to see what else they can do. That usually tells me that they've got plans and stuff coming instead of just the like hot fad thing right now in comics of like, well, here's a five issue mini series. So here's these, and then we're going to have a trade and then we're never going to touch it again. Um, which, you know, has like, as a sucker for trades, that's what I pick up anyway. But I just, there's something to be said about the long term storytelling yeah, uh, I that so. I, I think that this is setting itself up for. Like, it, this is the second issue, and Mumra has only been in two panels, like total. Yeah. And he's the main protagonist. So, yeah. um, it's a lot of fun i i keep telling my like i picked up the first issue because it's thundercats and i love that i loved when wildstorm did the all of the mini series that they did like 2009 ish uh in there Uh, i'm sure that that timing is off however (laughs) um (laughs) that like i really liked those because they just felt different and it was uh, they did a bunch of different creative teams that worked on a bunch of different Thundercats books and they were all separate stories that were all Thundercats based. Um, And so they all felt very different. And this time I'm kind of happy that it's, this is the Thundercats book. There aren't, you know, they're not doing 74 different titles. They're not doing, you know, a Lionel book, a Snarf book, a Chitara book, a Mutants book, a Mumra, like, you know, they're just keeping it. Here's the team. Here's what we know fans expect. Uh, They did a very brief setup, but because I know the Thundercats, I was like, oh, they're leaving a ton out to make this a 22-page book. Um, So it is kind of geared more towards existing fans, I would say. However, like, it's not hard to pick up. It's it's a very similar team dynamic, so... And I was going to say that, Chris. I like the question I asked you about the, the Gargoyles, Thundercats. You know, is another one. I know, I know, I know. It's another one I missed. That's all right. And I, the I, show I, did not hold up. <laughs> the cartoon <laughs> is not amazing anymore. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. So, yeah. but I've picked this comic up, and I've got to admit, it is a lot of fun. And it, 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 I was curious. I was just curious between you know some of these these brand new franchises that have come back through. Yeah. For, yeah, go on then. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get it. You know, reel, reel me in. I've got to say, I've enjoyed the first two issues. You don't have to, like you say, it's, and and you said with uh, gargoyles, there are probably a lot of treats in there, which I don't mind. There's a lot of treats in there for the fans, but what I like is when they can bring some new people on board and entertain you as well. 
I think they've done a good job of that there. And yeah. it's it's an easy read. They haven't yes. made it heavy. And yes. I think um, the Conan comic with their rotating, so they're doing five, four or five issues, story arcs with uh, different artists, same writer, but different artists. See, I don't mind that. When you've got a rotating, you know, you could do a five issue story with the same, as long as it's the same artist. Well, and, and I think the same writer is a given nowadays, but yeah. as long as it's the same team on it and then they swap it out, and but there's still a quality, I don't mind that. I don't mind that. And if it gives all the creators time, you know, getting back to the consistency of these books, yeah. uh, if the same team is staying on for the first two story arcs, that's, that's amazing. I mean, the only one I can think of off the top of my head at the moment that is, has been really, really impressive is Mark Wade and uh, Dan Mora on World's Finest. Mm, yeah. DC's World's Finest. And it really shows. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think something like as the, for the reader, I think it makes it a much different experience, even for not people that have been reading comics for decades. Like you can just tell that one of my favorite runs and my favorite duos is Jeff Lemire and Andre Sorrentino. Oh. Um, and like their their tandem on Green Arrow that they did it just is so rich because you can tell they were like, well, we're going to lay some of the very small groundwork here and then we're going to build on it in 10 issues. And like, you can just tell that there's all of that plotting and planning. And that's how Jeff Lemire is anyway, is he's a very, there's just layers of everything and nothing is ever what it seems like. Uh, like I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but yeah, it, it like the two of them together, I basically just told my local comic shop, like, hey, anything Bone Orchard Mythos, just pull it. Uh, like, it, I don't care. It's from the two of them. I'll take it. Primordial, I'll take it. Like, I, it, it doesn't even have to be, you know, Bone Orchard. Like, it can be anything that they put out. Just give it to me. Uh, same it, that yeah, I'm, I'm the same with Jeff Lemire, to be fair. But, um, Tenement is, uh, mm -hmm. I've, I've really did enjoy it. Yep. And I read the first six of that. And then I was like, I need to wait for the, like, they're doing a hardback collection in July. I was like, you know what? There's a lot to this. And I felt, I felt like I was missing part of the story. Cause that's one that for me, at least I have to be very intentional with like putting blinders onto everything else and just focusing yeah. on what they're reading. Cause Sorrentino puts so much into his artwork anyway. But there's like very subtle little not there's a website that's dev devoted to trying to pick out all of the easter eggs from all of the stories that they've done in the mythos so far and how they all connect and it's just like pages and pages of stuff and so if somebody is doing all of that i at least need to give it my full attention <laughs> you know so <laughs> but like i'm just gonna wait for the the collected hardback and then i'll sit down for two hours and just pour over the artwork and read it and yeah really I think flesh that's it a good out. call I, I think Lemire's work is probably and not just Lemire there are a lot of stories no, it's, it's not the writers per se I think it's the stories that they're they're creating now I think that do lend themselves to the the, the trade paperback rather than a monthly because particularly with Tenement and and a lot of the stuff we're talking about actually I've got to admit or or, or say something like Welltree, which I isn't in my top 10, but I've left this issue there because I want to get two or three issues stacked up yeah, and keep up with it. It's such a complex, and I'm enjoying it. It doesn't make it a bad thing, but it just makes the monthly format a, maybe a little bit outdated. But I think yeah. definitely uh, Tenement is one. that, And in my last comic review, when I've done uh, the, is it issue 10, the tenement that it was the last issue and i've got to admit, i've got to admit sorrentino's artwork is using so many references there that i could probably do it uh, i mean I've got, I've got a book there on dante's inferno yeah and the old artwork from it when it was first published and the guy who did the wood uh not the wood carvings what did you call it the block print the wood Oh yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. And Sorrentino's used used that, and there's some 
and I, in the last issue, but I am going to research it because I can see he's got some classical references in there that he must be enjoying. Yeah. He, he must be enjoying. Uh, I'm not saying he's plagiarizing anything. I'm just saying he's using that as a, as as really beautiful references for his for his artwork. So uh, yeah, yeah that's, okay, that's too good. So you've got two franchisees. Yep, and actually, both of them were done by Drew Moss on artwork. Like he did the art on both of them. So, right. oh, okay. Yep. That's that's, cool. that, that's why I wanted to do those back to. But there's a couple connections that some of my books have, and that's Been, that's I one of them. It's, <laughs> it's seamless. I think we've you know we don't even know what we're doing, but it seems like we don't. But we do. We, we do. do. We do. Yeah. And <laughs> my next my next one up link in a way linked linked to spectacular spider-men in a way you won't think of but wonder woman mm -hmm. now tom king i do think tom king can split people i, I do see as many people to be fair say oh as they go on um, you know he, he's so polarizing it seems he's, he's not just a writer that just it's just like maybe like Jeff Lemire, he just writes great stuff or Ram V. You don't hear anyone go, ah, Ram V or boo. It's but Tom King, I've got to say anyway, but on Wonder Woman, I've been a little bit apprehensive. But I've got to say, he has been delivering, but this issue, where that Spider-Man, Spider-Man issue was a day in the life, this issue. It's kind of like that break between, so it's issue seven. So you've had the first six issues in tents. Wonder Woman and all the Amazonians are being hunted. Mm -hmm. And this issue seven, she meets up with, the basic premise of this whole entire issue is she meets up with Superman to buy a birthday present for Bruce Wayne. <laughs> and it's That's in awesome. a shopping centre. In, on a space station in the middle of nowhere, the, the biggest space station, uh, the biggest shopping shopping mall in the universe. Now, I've got to admit, first couple of pages, I thought, what? What? But I'll tell you what he's done, which what delighted me, he's gone full Alan Moore with it. It really, it really did remind me of Alan Moore. Uh, but in the meanwhile, Tom King didn't ignore the fact that this was connected connected to what's gone on for the past six issues. And there's moments where Superman is kind of asking Diana, like, are you all right? Like, he obviously knows what's going on. And yeah. he knows this is just a distraction. Mm. And there's some really beautifully done, poignant moments in it that just, and spoiler alert, by the way, if no one's read this issue and you haven't got it yet or you do want to read it. So just a quick warning, spoiler alert. At the end of it, it sets up Superman to help her out because he hasn't appeared for the first thing. It's been kicking off really badly for Wonder Woman and all the Amazonians in the first six issues. But it wasn't until this issue that it made me wonder, oh, yeah, where has he been? Why didn't he help his friend out? Hmm. You know why? Why didn't he do that? Yeah. And yeah, I think Tom King's going to answer those questions in the next few issues. I hope. I hope he doesn't. He's really set me up for a fall there. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's set me up. If Superman's not in the next issue, help me out. And one who's going to oh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> oh yeah, perhaps I'll be on the other side of the fence with uh with, with Tom King. Yeah. Again, that'll make a stonk it. And I do find myself saying in my weekly comic reviews that, you know, if you don't want to buy these monthly floppies, the first first six issues of that uh, Wonder Woman run, that Tom King, and uh, who's the artist on that? March. William, William, Dick William. Get the artist. Anyway, but at least they, he was on for the whole six issues. Very nice. It was really a, actually it wasn't him. I think that's a different artist, but it doesn't matter because I was talking about issue seven. But <laughs> sometimes they do make. I think they're almost constructed in a way now. Do you think for trade paperbacks? No one's 
because you haven't got publishers and editors smoking their cigars in an office in New York going, where's the next issue of Marvel team up? You know, where's the next yeah. issue of, of DC presents? It, yeah. It's, it's not like that anymore. It's yeah, very structured I, and. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. They, they know what they're doing. I, uh, a buddy of mine is now the editor for a local indie publisher here in, in the States. Um, and we were talking about creating books and he was like, I know that you like want to write. And I know we've talked about it before. Uh, he was like, don't start with like what we're targeting because publishers are just targeting stories that can eventually be collected into a trade because that's what sells. There's more overhead, like the, the, um, what am I trying to, the overhead, like the costs and then the turnaround profit, it, the margins are so thin on floppies they're much wider and much more comfortable for a publishing company on the trades yeah. and the story and the art and everything is already there. They're just putting it together. Packaging so, it, yeah. yeah. So he was like, we're definitely like, we, we look for, you know, we're not looking for a, a 50 issue, you know, saga collection or the walking dead. That's going to go on for 5,000 yeah. issues. Like we're looking for, five to seven issues that we can collect into a trade and then sell for at a 20 25 dollar price point and people are going to buy that all day because it's still a better deal than buying the each individual issue as it comes out yeah so and it's got, it's got longevity as well yeah it, it just sit on the shelf and you know and from the comic book shop side of it obviously mm -hmm. side shops as well it was nice when you could just get copies of i don't know watchmen Dark Knight Returns, the the main X Men stuff, or when they started doing the, those big thick essential, when yeah. Marvel started doing the, the black and white essential X Men, essential Spider Man, yep. they were great. They were and they were such a fantastic price point as well. Oh yeah, I know yeah, they, were got... more, they were fantastic price point because yeah. Marvel are straying off the the path a bit with their uh, pricing structure. I don't know why, right. But um, in image, I mean, especially like uh, with the um, Mark Miller or Miller, yeah, uh, stuff. I mean, it, it, what was it? Two dollars ninety nine. I mean, it, it, it's on one dollar ninety nine. I think some of them. It just gives them away. Yeah, almost compared to you know a four dollar ninety nine Marvel book sometimes, and it makes you. Like, you wouldn't mind if it was super super special every issue but when right. you're looking at it and you're thinking you know yeah anyway yeah, I digress. anyway <laughs> as i always do what is your what is your next choice please chris so next um i'm gonna swing over to the horror field excellent uh, with the the devil that wears my face uh this is issue five of six now, and... I know, now I know that writer's name. I don't know this book at all, but I do know that writer's name from the Punisher. He David... done the latest Punisher run for Marvel. Really? Okay. Yeah. yeah, here's the back cover. Also, just as fun. Oh, um, wow. yeah. I love when covers aren't like when the back isn't just like an ad, and they they add art to the back as well. Like that just. That was part of the reason I initially picked it up was because the covers are just outstanding. And really the art by uh, it's Alex Cormack that's doing the art on this. Um, it's just so like bonkers bananas. Like it's just, it's so wild um, that, and I've read a lot of comics, but there's stuff that he's doing that I just don't, I just don't have comprehension for. I'm like, how would, how would you even think to do that? Um, yeah. and it's, I mean, it's a great, like, it's a possession tale at its heart. Um, what? hence the, the title of the devil wears my face. But at the end of this issue, uh, the, it's basically, so a demon is chasing after and then possesses an archbishop who then is climbing the ranks of the Catholic church, um, to then try and make it as evil as possible. Like that's his end goal is to lead the church. And at the end of this issue, um, spoilers <laughs> at the end of this <laughs> issue uh he's revealed to be the pope like he steps out as the pope and well, so in, just in, in, like, modern, in modern day yeah well no it's set i'm sorry it's set uh in the past um but yeah so here's the 
the final big reveal. And it's got all of the all of the layers. Oh, that does look like, fantastic. Flames oh, around everything. Oh, like, there's just so much. Who published that, Chris? Mad Cave. Mad Cave. Yep. Don't yeah. know why, and the, why I guess that. Because yeah, it's, it's, uh, one, it's, it's only on threads that I think a few people have started talking about Mad Cave. Um, yeah, it, it's, I mean, my next book, uh, The Connection, my next book is also Mad Cave. Wow. Go, go, go for it. Go for while you're talking about Mad Cave. Is it horror as well? It is as well. Um, this one actually yeah, awesome. is done uh, by some buddies of mine. So I went to college with the guy that edited and did the lettering for this. This is Skeeter's. Um, this is the fourth and final issue. Just like bananas. Again, very gruesome. This is basically uh, like a B horror movie in a comic book. Uh, there's mutated mosquitoes that infest a town when they're having like a, a seafood festival. And so there's a ton of people and they become mutant mosquitoes. And like when they infest a, a cow, there's like a mutant mosquito cow and it's life size. And it just like it only gets crazy. And there's so much just like gore and and guts and everything everywhere uh it's written by bob france and kevin cuff uh they are a writing duo that i have been familiar with uh mm -hmm. for a couple years now i've done a couple of kickstarters that they have put out and then uh kelly williams is the artist and he's going to tie into my last book uh that i'm going to talk about but he just i met him at a very small con uh in northern kentucky and seeing his artwork and as bloody and gruesome as, as it was when i talked to him it was like you're you're kelly williams like you're the guy because you're he was so like hey man how's it going yeah, it. It. <laughs> he was so mild man <laughs> it just wasn't at all what i expected um that's because you're yeah. getting it out on the page he's there yeah it he, has he, to he, be... <laughs> He's unburdening. He's unburdening himself. Yeah, yeah you got to have an outlet. And <laughs> this is his with the mutant mosquitoes. But I talked to Kevin about it. Uh, and he was like, yeah, you know, Bob and I were just kind of kicking ideas back and forth and trying to like one up each other on the level of just ridiculous that we were including. And Mad Cave at every turn said, yeah, OK. Yeah. All right. Hey, we're going to do this. Yeah. OK. Like they just didn't. They didn't hold him back at all. He said there was one thing they took out because they, and it wasn't because they were told to take it out. It's because Mad Cave had the reaction of like, ah. <laughs> and he was like, okay, no, we'll just, we can, we can, we can tone it down. It's fine. But yeah, really? He did, and there's like <laughs> blood all over the pages. Um, it's a very good, also just kind of look at like a small town biopic almost of like when you put, just normal run-of-the-mill small town folks into extreme circumstances seeing how they react to that uh is also like very enjoyable so even if it's not going to be read for the gore and the just crazy monsters that are happening um it's also a really fun if you it's a slice of life tale set in a b horror movie from the 80s covered in blood and that's and always that's, a good way to identify with, you know, or find a way in to the story and a, a connection to the yeah. story. They do that slice of life stuff. Yep. It's, and that's, it's a staple of horror, isn't it? Especially yeah. B movie. I mean, B movie horror, like um, back in the day, we, uh, films like Reanimator. Yeah. And, you know, I used to love all, I used to love all that stuff. But I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm well off the, I'm well off the grid with all that stuff now. But I did when Fangoria first came out. Mm -hmm. and films like that were out i used to i used to love that stuff but the the first one that that you mentioned there did you pick up um a book called sacrament by awa i peter milligan i think i i think i had the first issue and then i forgot to tell my shop to pull it for me and then not enough people bought the first issue so he just stopped oh, so i did. only have the first issue i did that <laughs> with a couple books <laughs> um, but that is well worth it if you want to pick up the trade of that if you liked that one mm -hmm. the awa trade uh because they that's what they do they always have awa i think always do nicely weird and wonderful quirky little stories yeah 
that, that are completely different. Obviously, Mad Cave are kind of um, they're going in for the horror, it seems, which is no nothing wrong with that. You know, make your name in, and people will know your brand. Yeah, but with AWA, I love the fact that they just throw out. You know, you're getting something different from them every yeah. time they've got that little uh, creator uh, team up. So I yeah. know some good, some good shirts. There's some different ones which I wouldn't, which I wouldn't. And it's weird that that uh, David Pipos or Piposa, however you pronounce his name, yeah, was writing the Punisher for Marvel, and then yeah. he's, he's writing crazy now stuff. Here he is doing Possession Tales of Mad yeah. <laughs> It just earns the money over there for Marvel and then does the good stuff for Mecca. There, <laughs> there it is. Yep. <laughs> okay. right, so what, what do you got? I'll keep it on the horror thing. The Infernals. I don't know if you saw this book. Because I know there's a load that come out from Image nowadays. Yeah. If you've heard or seen uh, the, the TV show Succession mm -hmm. on TV, this is that, but we've Real demons. Okay. The family, the family. It's the son and the sisters. It's it's two. It's two brothers and one sister. Fight fighting over the the old man dying and, it, but it's it's very literal. It's very literal. It's there's, there's nothing. Uh, how can I explain it? There's nothing. You know, you literally have like the butler in the, in their mansion. It's this kind of ram horned, this ram horned being who escorts people in, and there's nothing. It's all very literal. There's, there, there, yeah, but I, very I on it. the news. Yeah, I love. Yeah, I love it for that. Issue two really, really kicked up a gear first issue just laid the, those foundations and again like we've been like we've been saying that'll make a, a, a cracking trade because that issue one you wait a month and i thought oh it could it could it was a bit dicey for me where i didn't know i didn't know anyone involved no i didn't know anyone involved the writers art team anyone but obviously image picked that up for a reason and i thought i'll, I'll just give it I'll just give it the issue too. You know, like sometimes you give a TV series, like two or three episodes, you think, well, they can't, they can't get it. Sometimes they can't get it all into episode one. Right. And I'm glad I, I kept on with issue two because it really ramped right up. Mm. And that, that'll be a great, whatever they're doing, four or five issues. But on, on that horror theme, it's, it's very, it's very, very good. On the, like the supernatural horror side of things. Um, no, I thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed that. Nice. Next one up. Oh, well, I did too. So you. Oh, go on. I will. I will do <laughs> another one. Should I keep it on a hub? Did I have another horror one? So fantasy horror wise, another. This. Ah, uh, this is one that I I wanted to talk to you about. Now this doesn't look like much on the shelf, and it was only. It's only the, the, the manager of me, me old mate Paul at my comic uh, local comic shop that said, you know, I have a go at that. And it's Tom King again. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I won't say I'm, I'm not his biggest fan, but I'm not his biggest hater. I, 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 you know, I'm just either way. <laughs> but the artwork, Bilquis Evely's artwork in this is absolutely sensational. And between them, what a, a, a again, that is going to be, it's going to be better read as, as, a, as, a, as a collection. Yeah. But that issue weaves a tale, you know, it's the classic manor house in the 1920s England. And we're just finding out about the characters and then it leaves a little tease at the end of the first issue. The artwork is is absolutely beautiful. I've got, got to say, I don't know how long it it, it, it takes her to do to do an issue, because uh, the last thing I know she did was the uh, the super, the Supergirl 
Woman of Tomorrow book. Oh, okay. All a few right. years ago. Yeah. So I don't know. And it is that European style of art. It's, 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 there's a light, there's a light touch to it. Almost almost a cartoony feel, but not not um an eccentric cartoony feel, but just yeah. that that definite European flavour to it, but but all the better for it because of the setting, the setting of the manor house and and the in the 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 era, yeah. the era of it, but not it's not horror yet, but you can see where it's going. Maybe at the moment it's just like a thriller, you think, yeah. But you can you can kind of see where it's going by the end of this issue. There is a little wink at the audience as if to say, you know, you know where it, you know where this is going. Yeah, that's, <laughs> <laughs> you you know you know. So uh, yeah, that's that's two kind of horror stroke filler, different genre. Yeah, stuff I've enjoyed. Yeah, so I I saw that one in my shop, but I didn't have the time to like really dig into anything other than what was on my list to find. And I saw the cover, and I I really hadn't heard anything about it before it came out. And I was just like, I don't even know what that is. Like, eh, maybe if people are talking about it, I'll give it a go or and so i just bypassed it and then i saw every like my threads was full of that book and it was like oh my god and yeah. i was like oh man i missed out <laughs> <laughs> well, and i went back like that weekend and he was sold out of all of it i would have been the same as you chris if it wasn't if it wasn't for paul saying oh look at because he knows what i'm like for the artwork isn't mm -hmm. because i always think that 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 beautiful artwork can elevate not a bad story, but it can elevate an average story. You know, you can have a great artistic storyteller on an average story and bosh, you've got that. But um, he knows I kind of go, I let my eye do the, the reading first. And he went, yeah, take a look at that. And I went, Oh yes. But I would, I would have done the same as you. I wouldn't have picked it up. The, I mean, you know, look at the cover. It doesn't yeah, exactly, it doesn't exactly it. scream. It's beautiful. Don't get me yeah. wrong. Beautifully rendered, beautifully coloured, but it doesn't scream by me, does it? Right. <laughs> but it, the thing I like about it is it will appeal to a larger audience, which is nice. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that. It's not just for us geeks that will appeal to. I hope, like. You know everything crossed a wide, much wider yeah. audience and bring, but dark dark horse that and the the other one I think we're both gonna have a look at or I don't know if <laughs> you said you didn't get Dawn Runner or did you get Dawn Runner one? Yeah, I did. So that's two dark horse books. Yeah. Where suddenly, pardon the pun, they're back in the running. Yeah. <laughs> See what I did. There? <laughs> See what I did there. You know. I'm not just there for the looks, do you know what I mean? Right, 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 right. Not just <laughs> <laughs> but we'll talk about that later. Maybe leave Dawn Runner to last if we both like that. All right. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Unless you wanted to talk about unless you wanted to talk about that next. But what else you got, Chris? What else you got for me? So the, the next book we were talking, we've this fits in. Uh we've been talking about trades. Yes. And I'm I'm usually when it comes to Jeff Lemire books. I'm usually a trade waiter um, because I, this whole shelf over here yeah. is all Jeff Lemire and Matt Kent, like the entire thing. Really? So uh, they like the two of them were, I, I picked up like work that they had done for the big two. And I was just like, this is so much better than just a normal, like big two tale. Yeah. What else have they done? And then, looking at looking them up i was like oh they've both done a ton of stuff and so over the past probably decade i've just been like scouring everywhere i can to find everything that they've done and i have just about all of it nice. um, so fish flies lemire has put out uh the chapters of this book on his sub stack which you can read and then okay. so it's actually been out for like two years if you've been following or i think it's on the paid tier for his sub stack um that you can read all of these chapters which i i don't because i buy the books anyway but then he's not collecting this into one volume 
Oh, like, really? these... That's interesting because they're like mini trades, aren't they? Because I've, yeah. I've been picking this up. I've yeah, been it's, it's, and he's, uh... drawing, he's drawing it as well, isn't he? Yeah, he's doing Which all of really it. Really quirky as, as flip. Yeah. To be fair, like it's really. It's yeah. it's super. His style is one that I can identify. Like any, there's there's only a handful of artists that if I see a cover, I'm like, oh, that's a. Lemire is one of them. We're like, oh, I didn't know Lemire did a cover for this. And Pedro, I'm like, yep, sure enough, there it is. Yeah. Um, and Matkin's another one. Christian Ward is another one. I can spot that guy's art from oh, across yes. the shop. Like that guy just could draw celery, and I would pay him all the money that I had <laughs> to yeah. get his yeah. celery in a cosmic yeah. twist or something. Um, but issue, so issue five of Fish Flies, um, it like, you're starting to realize that there is more i've been waiting for this i've been waiting for this issue because until this one it was like okay so there's a girl and she's going through some stuff and uh she has a giant fish fly as a friend who used to be a criminal that overnight turned into the fish fly and she befriended him because she doesn't have any other friends so it's a tale about friendship right well it's lemire so it has to be more and i've been yeah. waiting for that like what's how is this gonna be more? And even reading this issue specifically, I was like, this can't just be a friendship tale, right? Like, that's not that's not what he my boy Jeff doesn't just do friendship. Because, <laughs> you know, we're super tight. And he this one flips it. And the last two or three pages, uh, he flips a switch that really had me go, Oh, here we go. Here we go, Jeff. And it just takes it to a completely different spot. Um, that I have no idea where that new spot is. Like, that's the cliffhanger of this issue is, wait, what just happened? Like, some, something just happened significant, and I don't know what that was or why that was or where that was. What are What is happening? And that's where I left this issue. And so, like, he always makes me just reevaluate everything because nothing is ever as simple as it seems and his artwork is the same way where it, it looks incredibly simplistic yeah like, yeah which as a cartoon so style yeah. and i mean the book is all it's all like basically monochromatic yes other than other than her red jacket everything is grays very light greens and maybe light yellows it's all mm. in that wheelhouse and even that changes after the switch is flipped. Like even the coloring changes. Which I, tells I, you... I've got to admit, I'm glad you said it kind of because I was drifting right off that. And I do like Jeff and Amaya. I like yeah. a lot of this stuff. But I was I was drifting right off that. Um yeah. I've got to admit, it's one of those books, and I do say it quite a lot in my weekly reviews, which is they need to get on with it now. Yeah. Come on. Because yeah. what 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 you can get, I think what what I will say with some of the indie publishers, well not just the indie publishers, all, all publishing now, where they know they're 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 doing a they're formatting it into four or five or six or eight issue trades. Mm -hmm. They're not getting on with it. They're taking an issue to do you know, you're you're getting filler issues, which you, you think I think to myself, well, why did you did you do that filler issue just so you could have a six issue? Try, I'm not talking specifically fish flies now. I'm just talking in general. Yeah, because sometimes you think, wow, come on, just just come on, come on now. You know, we've had an issue of that. Come on, I do like the story and characterization. We need it, but. I'm on now. Yep, and yep. I, I did do that fish after issue three. I thought, oh yeah, that's that's where I pages, was. there's a lot of pages here where you're doing that. And I don't mind an easy read, like I said about spectacular Spider-Man. I don't mind. We all want that easy read. Right. Just right. have a quick cup of tea and you've got to get on with things. We you can't all be a kind of cerebral kind of experience. But yeah, so with fish flies. Oh, I'm, I'm glad. No, I'm glad it's um because I, I think I've got up to issue four, but I haven't read issue four. Yeah, but then... issue four for me was the one where it was like, 
okay he's going somewhere right like that that was but i waited to read i'm terrible i'll i'll buy a ton of books and then i just won't read a bunch and i'll be like i'm reading trade i want to make a dent on my shelf and so i'll read a bunch of trades one month yeah. and i won't read any of my floppies and then the next month i suddenly like i have too many stacks of floppies everywhere i gotta read the and so i'll go on a tear and read all of them and that's what i did in february was it was my month to catch up i had been what? three months deep of not reading anything so i had three months of everything to read and somehow it ended up with the first four of fish flies and so i sat down and just cranked through all four of them back to back to back and it was very much like i'm glad that i already had these four but like what are you doing man like where is this going and it because it did it felt like we were just like okay yeah we established it like the girl's got a runny nose like got it <laughs> yeah we got that <laughs> you know like her her parents are kind of it's rough got it yeah okay well, and yeah. but yeah this one i felt as i was reading it i was like surely this is gonna drop like the shoe is gonna drop here right like this has to be the turn i don't know the total count that he's going for i don't know if it's gonna be you know 12 10 5 like 6 i i have no idea what the final That's count interesting. is it's not, he's, so you're saying he's not doing it in the trade format this is it this is it yeah is it. there because they're that. basically like 60 page yeah. square bound issues which i'm a sucker for that format yeah, um and I, i'm a sucker in general I've, I've gotten to a point in my comic reading and collecting that i would rather buy trades uh one shots and like the just collect give me a full story like don't my memory's terrible <laughs> my wife will tell anybody that has an ear my my memory is terrible and so if i'm going to be keeping up with 10 different stories every single month and some of them are easy reads and then others are like hang on i gotta read that again because i know i missed something like it's just too uh, just pushing my intelligence a bit because I'm not a PhD person. <laughs> I'm not that I'm the same. I'm the same, Chris. Sometimes, I, you know, if you get, I probably say I get, I must get 30 or 40 different titles a month. Yeah. That's a lot of different storylines to keep in your head. Yeah. And yep. that's why I long, I long for the days where the Marvel style, the Marvel style, when I tried, when I tried out writing for Marvel, within the first six pages, I don't know if you know this, Back in the day, every Marvel comic, within the first six pages of every issue, every month, you needed to establish what went on in the last issue and what everyone's powers were. Mm. Within the first six pages. And that meant that every month you got a comic, which you could probably skip it if you remembered what Thor did last issue. Yeah. But it meant that guys and girls could just pick that comic up and I'm going back a long, long way, but there's something to be said for a little bit of repetition in the first couple of pages. Or at least story like, so far on that. Yeah, I, yeah. Give me, give me on the inside. That's it. You know, last time in issue number 17, like <laughs> that's it. Yeah. That's so helpful. Yeah. Could, or it, give it, me, the summary with the character off. faces yeah like oh okay yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah i remember yeah. Yeah. and then yeah. when they say when they tell you it you go oh yeah that was it that was this comic <laughs> yes yeah and i i do that all the time so i like that's why i prefer the one shots the collected complete stories and then here lately if if i'm buying a monthly series it's because it's from a creator that is on my list of like, I'm just going to buy everything that they do. Yeah. Or uh, it's because I'm also doing a bunch of like, I'm supporting a ton of Kickstarters Boy. and those cost more <laughs> because you're helping to like produce the thing than just going to your shop where it's already produced. And you're like, Oh cool. Yeah. Uh, I'll take this one. Let's I'll buy that. Whatever the Kickstarters you, you, really have to be more invested in supporting the creators yeah. and having done that like that's why i picked up skeeters because like i bought kit books on kickstarter from bob and kevin i went to college with jazz who did the lettering and editing 
and I didn't know Kelly Williams other than like he had done the Bountiful Garden book um, that I don't even remember what publisher it was on. But it was about a bunch of kids lost in space and the AI is trying to take care of them and they have to figure out what is happening. Um, just super interesting stuff. But his artwork on that was so just creepy that I was like, all right, but like if it's got Kelly Williams, I'm probably going to read it. Nice. And so now he's on my list and he shows up later in my stack um, from a book that was on Kickstarter. <laughs> I'm going to talk about, I'm cheating a little bit on the 10th one, but if Joe can do it, I can do it. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's no hard and fast rules here. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's a relaxed conversation. Yeah. Of course it is. Of course it is. So what, what is your next one, Chris? So my next one, we can, Keep Dawn Runner for late. Uh, I re-entered Valiant. Mm. With, and, and if I'm being honest with you, I don't know if it's Bloodshot Unleashed Reloaded or Bloodshot Reloaded Unleashed. <laughs> you can figure it out for yourself. That's how yes. the title looks. Yes. I think, all, yeah. Either, either or. Either. It's Bloodshot, uh, which is why my comic shop guy pulled it for me. Because uh, for a while there, I was only reading Valiant. And then I don't remember what happened. Uh, I probably ran out of money. This is probably what <laughs> happened. And so I backed off a ton. And then I've been slowly adding some of them back. And I actually talked to a guy on threads about this because I was like, they're doing some weird stuff. Uh, they've partnered with a new with Alien Books, who's doing all the publishing for them now. And so they're like Valiant is still Valiant Entertainment, mm. but they're kind of evolving as a company. And they were doing weird like crypto stuff. And I was just like, uh, and like NFTs. And I was like, you're a comic company. Can you just make good comics, please? And so I kind of backed off for a while because they were just doing all that stuff that I really just don't care about. Wow. But when they got back to, they put out a, um, a Bloodshot series that had uh, Juan Jose Rip on it. Rip, Rip. Um, and he is a very like highly detailed uh very gory artist which for bloodshot it works perfectly because if you don't know bloodshot is his blood has been replaced by nanites and so he can take any damage and just keep on trucking and it doesn't matter and so it starts with um a hole being blasted in his face where the first like bloodshot reloaded left off and so it starts there and then it comes kind of full circle as he battles this guy with impenetrable skin who's a robot that just doesn't feel any pain. So it's it's just like violence to the 10th degree. And also it's narrated. It takes a deep cut uh, back to like the Bloodshot Reborn. There's a lot of Rees in Bloodshot. And that's kind of the confusing thing with Valiant is they do a lot of that because they are very much, here's five issues of a story called whatever. And yeah. it's like, blood. so we had Bloodshot Released or uh, Bloodshot Reborn, Bloodshot Reloaded, uh, now we have Bloodshot Unleashed Reloaded, and it just like it's a lot to keep track of. Um, but they do a they do a really nice nod. There was an imaginary friend that he had when he was trying to figure out who he was and the programming and the nanites and what was real and what wasn't called Blood Squirt, who is a very like overly Saturday morning cartoony looking. Like everything else is bloody and gory. And then you just have this very perfectly pristine and clean blood squirt. And he's the one narrating this issue. Is that, and, like, is that like Godzuki? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it just, and like he, Bloodshot has conversations like, you're not real, shut up. And he's like, you're still talking to me. And he just has that, like, oh, this is just how he is. <laughs> And he's breaking the fourth wall, talking to the readers. Like, I guess it's time to turn the page. And you're like, it, it is. Yeah, I'm going to turn. And you turn the page and he's like, hey, you made it. And it's like, okay. <laughs> and so you can tell that the writer, uh, Dennis Camp, is just having a ton of fun with like utilizing and playing with Blood Squirt. And I love when comics can do that. When they're self-aware enough that they're like, you know what? let's just have some fun. Like, let's just poke a little bit of fun at ourselves and at the yes. readers. And and that's what this does. So I'm, I'm in, uh, I'm fully in for it. And it's, it's just, and it's a fine line. It's a fine line it to navigate, uh, which Deadpool 
Deadpool as a character can do under the, the you know, under safe hat. She Hulk did do it many she did it first many, yep. many years ago. I don't know yep. about now. They play it so straight now that it's a bit it's just no good. But yeah, many, many years ago. But those characters, but doesn't last long. Probably five or six issues is probably best, I think. Yep. And then let it rest and then come back with another idea and then you know, give us another squirt as it were. Yeah, so that's that's where we're at with this one. They do have uh, some more titles that are coming that I'm more excited about because they delve into like the magic realm side of Val the Valiant Universe, and like that for me, Shadow Man was my guy in the '90s, and that was the oh, first that cosplay Ashley that Wood? I ever did. Is that Ashley Wood artwork on that. Uh, yes. Ashley? Yeah, and then Bob Hall was writing, starting with issue seven. I think um, I think I've still got those. Yeah, I only bought them for Ashley Wood's artwork, and um, I did pick up Exo Man of War. Yeah, the new one with um, new one. with Lee. Yeah, yeah, that was as mad as a bag of frogs. <laughs> it was. <laughs> <laughs> It was. It was. <laughs> it was. It was. Cuckoo, cuckoo. Yeah. It was like, yeah. what? Uh, what? And again, I, like, and in England, I don't know why the issue, I think issue six arrived before issue five. And issue five, if she, it was all delayed and, and, oh, it was all mental at the end of it. So what I will do one day is I will get all the issues out of that box down there. Quite, I know it's at the end because it's the last box and it's X and I'll do A yes. to Z on that side. Yeah. So I will get those issues out and try again to make I, like I know there is a narrative there. Yeah. But his, his artwork, he I don't know, he, he must have got some brown paint cheap or something. <laughs> oh Sharpie boy. Because it was getting murkier and murkier and murkier. And every now and again, and I love his artwork normally, but it wasn't wasn't his best. Sometimes I think with a lot of the a lot of these creative teams, whether you're a writer or an artist, I think you need a good editor to just rein them in. Yeah. Just, the, just that little bit. I'm not saying to censor them or stifle their creativity, but hone it hone their madness you know just their insanity just go yeah oh a minute whoa you know when they bring some pages in you go whoa i can't make it what, am I, what am I looking at yeah yeah i know i know we're in the alien spaceship now and there's uh, there's a monster there somewhere i know you see it but can the reader oh, i don't know yeah. can we put it <laughs> somewhere on it sure. anyway. right <laughs> it's being a little bit facetious there but you know what i mean yes yep. we so I think some some of them could really benefit with an edit, ed, an editor that could hone them and, and it'd be sensate. Which is where people like Jeff Lemire and that come from. When they you work for the big two, you would have you work for a publisher and mm -hmm. who has an editor and, an, and that editor you work for him or her and they hone you. They say no, we want this done, and I think there's lots to be said for that. Because their focus is on the customer and the business end. You're coming, you know. Oh, Jeff's over there saying, right, I've got this story about this fly, this fish fly. And they're going, no. <laughs> we can do this. <laughs> yep. But you know, anyway. Yep. So what's your next one? So from the sublime to the ridiculous or the other way around, this comic... Mm. Now, we can't get more mainstream than this. In what we've been talking about, I don't think we've really... Well, I've done Spider-Man, but you can't get more mainstream than this. But that mad bag of frogs that I was talking about, Peach Momoko for me, I think Marvel have taken a massive risk with this one. I, I really do think they have. I love it. Personally, I love it because I love Peach Momoko's artwork. But again, she's just out there. Like, I don't know if you ever got the Demon Days and the Demon Wars and the Demon This and the Demon That that she's done in the past. But 
beautiful. <laughs> I yeah, don't I, know. So I only know her as a cover artist. Oh, I've wow. only ever she seen won. like when they brought her in and she started yeah. doing covers for Marvel. Um, I don't know if I've still but but that book, oh here we go. So I know this is all what she's done for Marvel in the past. So D Wars, but this is all her artwork. This is all her artwork inside. This would be a series that we had to follow somehow. <laughs> um they was all number ones. Look, Demon Days X Men number number one. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's another Demon Days X Men number one. And there's a Demon Days Mariko. Look. Hello. Anyway, all beauty, all beautiful stuff. And I like so she's not just a cover artist. And she's done some star. She's done a um a really a, a really beautiful Star Wars story as well for Marvel. A, um, a Darth Vader story that was kind of you know, really trippy. Yeah. So I do think that was a big risk. The I think why I love that book so much is that I haven't been able to pick up an X-Men book for so long because it's so impenetrable now. It's so that Krakoa, so or as I call it, the crap, the Krapakoa era. <laughs> and that's trademark, by the way. <laughs> I don't want to see that. I don't want to see that on Longbox Punk's channel and on I your and that's going to be TM. I'm going to put a little link up there. It's going to go ting. It's going to go <laughs> TM. <geeky old. laughs> no, I literally just made that up. The crapper color era. Um, it, it is an impenetrable wall, which is a shame because I love those characters. Yeah. I, 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 I really do. That, Chris, was a big risk. Nothing to do with the X-Men, apart from the fact that that girl there is Armour, one of the lesser characters from years gone by. Other than that, that's your link to X-Men, and it's ultimate, so they haven't got a... They're not bogged down in the continuity. But I still think I've got to admire them for the fact that... I, I think that is a massive risk to put Peach Momoko on an X-Men book. That could have gone badly wrong, Yeah, I think. I think it still could do. It, I, I think the potential is there for, you know, Ultimate Spider-Man, Ultimate Black Panther, they're quite straight and, you know, but, but I hope people are up for that because I, I am. I so am. For, for someone that hasn't been buying really anything from the big two, uh, with the Ultimate books, is it, like I remember Ultimate Spider-Man from like early two thousands. Why back um, then? Loved that, but as now, now where I'm at, like I don't understand the dis. Like, why does it have to be distinguished as Ultimate X Men? Like, why can't it just be Armor? Big. I'm. I'm going to use the M word now. Multiverse. So. Okay. But they did set up with old Hickman. He set up the ultimate invasion and ultimate universe. So you've basically got a future evil Reed Richards who goes back in time and makes sure that no superheroes are created. End of. So what these ultimate books are, they're after ultimate invasion where you can't kind of stop the, you can't stop Peter Parker, even though Reed, Reed, evil Reed Richards, what's he called? The Maker? I think he's called The Maker. Hmm. Might be wrong. Anyway, he's gone back in time and made sure that Peter Parker never becomes Spider-Man. He doesn't get bitten by that spider. But it something happens anyway. You can't stop. You know that kind of trope where you can't, yep. you know, you try and change the future by going back in the past. So what's happening with Ultimate Black Panther spider-man and x-men is that yeah nature is finding a way to create the superheroes see hence okay. with this one i think you don't have to have because i think to under to fully understand spider-man and black panther you need to have invested in ultimate invasion 
uh, and I think there's one other book, Ultimate Invasion and some, anyway, so there's five or six books by Hickman that set all this up. Okay. But with this Ultimate X-Men book, you can pick that up. That's a, It's got a manga sensibility about it as well. You don't need to know anything because you're just following a girl. It, it, it's gone all, for me, all the way back to the basics of X-Men where the powers manifest themselves at a certain age or if you get a, a, an emotional high, that issue one goes all the way back to it with one female character at school, under pressure, not knowing what's going on. I really, really enjoyed it. But the, the artwork helped it. But because it's set in Japan and it's got that sensibility of that manga thing about it, yeah. like I say, I, I, I think that I still maintain a big, big risk for Marvel, but I think it's paid off. I think people are enjoying it. Yeah. So far. I don't know how long she will stay on this book because it will only last for as long as she's on it. Mm. I don't know if it's going to work unless they've got another kind of manga-esque artists and i think there's plenty of them about now because i think there's a young generation coming through that are it's like the guy that's on uh transformers mm, yeah. uh, not not just him that they've got that manga you know with the lines going off yeah. and the whoosh nothing yeah. wrong with that. i've been loving transformers um is it darren warren john daniel warren johnson darren warren Anyway, it doesn't matter what he's not. But anyway, all these are this new generation of artists are coming along. So perhaps they could follow her, but I don't know. But I but I enjoyed it, and you can jump on that issue one without knowing what's gone on before. They do they do give you a little hint at the beginning what has gone on. Sure. Yeah, and I enjoyed it for that. Yeah. Cool. Nice. Proper, main, proper mainstream. You've got, bring, you've got to bring it right anything. back down to earth, Chris. You've got to bring it. That's so in the mainstream. Uh, let's go. We'll go here. Slightly stepping out of the mainstream from IDW. Ah. Uh, we're going to go to Golgotha. Golgotha. Yeah. Motor Mountain. Oh, wow. Look, that's look a, at the cover, right? That is cover. It's just that I'm a sucker for neons, for anything cyberpunk, and this cover feels very much like that. Yeah, I love that cover. You get into it, and it's not as sci-fi as you might think from the cover, uh, which at first I was like, really? These are just two brothers in Kentucky? Like, Golgotha is a town in Kentucky. <laughs> and their big dreams are to come to Cincinnati, Ohio, which I can say because it's like 50 minutes down the road from me. All right. Uh, okay. Where I'm at. So I was like, they're going to Cincinnati? That's their goal? <laughs> but they're they're just a couple drug dealers. And they wear the masks so that none of the like mafia that they're basically dealing with recognizes them so that if they they try and basically are setting them up an uh, asteroid lands outside of their barn where they're cooking all of their drugs and they go instead of selling these drugs that have gone bad because an asteroid just crashed through our barn let's just grind up the asteroid and sell that <laughs> and so he was like yeah we can make triple the price and so they wear the masks so that they don't get yeah. you know tracked back and that it's it's kind of a uh, figuring out like how they're going to go about doing that. And so it spends the first half of the issue setting that stage. The second half is where then I was thankful that it didn't just end. If it ended at the, after the first half, I would have been like, I'm done. I, I'm done. Like, I don't need another tale about drug dealers, you know, okay. but it turns out that that asteroid had some like alien parasites with it. So when they crush it up and give it to these guys, it then kind of like the parasite takes over their bodies and just all hell breaks loose. And it turns into just a crazy like, wait, what, what, what are these things? And then it ends. And like it, that's how it, it sets up 
the rest of the series of it. This is more a, I think the series is going to take place after this happened. And so I feel like this was, yes, it was an issue one. And that's the point is to set up the story, but I think it's going to time jump. And I, th- huh. I would be surprised if like issue two through the rest aren't taking place like six months to a year to two years later where then this parasite thing has taken over earth and that's that's what i'm expecting where i'm expecting it to go what but it's it had a yeah the it had enough in that second half of the first issue to to really just have me go like so it's not about drug dealers what has <laughs> happened <laughs> so that's anyway. it's almost like a prologue yeah yeah that that's how i read it i could be way off base um and it might just continue, you know, chronologically, but I, it doesn't feel like it's going to do that. So, but this was definitely a, uh, you always talk about like your cover of the week. This was definitely that time. I didn't have plans to pick this up oh, and I, I saw this cover and I was just like, I have to like, the logo looks super metal too. That's and it. I was just yeah. like, you know, it's super. It does. It does as it goes. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot it... to be said about that. Like, I mean, I've got to admit, if I'd have seen that in my comic shop, I would have definitely gone for that. Yeah. They definitely at least at least picked it up and had a look. That is a striking cover. Yep. Yeah, it's. I mean, neon covers gets me every time. You had those crazy masks on top of it. And then the metal logo as well. I was like, all right, I'm, I flipped it open and the, the artwork is super clean yeah. in it. Like there's not too much. I can get lost if there's too much detail or if there's too much shading or, you know, they want to put 17 tones of black into a <laughs> thing, like just simplify it, please. And yeah. that book definitely does that. So it, um, yeah. it actually has the, uh, it's Robbie Rodriguez. He did uh, spider Gwen. I met him like eight years ago when his career was starting and he had just like spider Gwen number one had just come out. Um, And I was like, who is this Robbie Rodriguez guy with like pink hair? And he's the artist on this book. So that was the other part of like, okay, well, I know, I know the guy I've like met him. I had a conversation with him about comics and the cover is freaking awesome. So I'll pick it up and see what happens. And now I'm like, all right, well, go with the flow. Guess I'm gonna keep picking this book up. <laughs> <laughs> well, Don't tell my wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sh- 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 no, I'm I'm in the same. That's why I've shut the door. Yeah, yeah. We, no one ever. Yeah, yeah. No one yeah. Spoil it. <laughs> but it's funny you say that. I'm the same. In the same uh, vein as that, I picked this one up this month. Napalm Lullaby. I don't think I've seen that one. Now, I just loved what a name for a comic or a film or a TV show. Napalm Lullaby. And I just loved the... But Rick Reminder, obviously, he's written, you know, quite, quite a bit of stuff now, but for everyone. But you, it's a it's um, a cyberpunk tale about what's what's the easiest way to proceed the story? A cyberpunk tale about uh, vir- virtual reality, okay. set in the future. Right, that's where we are. But what I liked about it was, is you know you know when you've got like the fir- the first chapter or the first episode of something but you're dropped into not into the middle of the story but by the end of this first issue you really don't know what's going on (laughs) you really don't know they haven't given you a proper introduction to the characters you know their name but so the two main characters on the cover like you know their names and you know that they've just that they've just successfully pulled off a virtual reality stunt where the bad guys think that they've really killed them they think they're really dead they've done a little heist and it and it's a cyberpunk tale set in the future but it starts off 
and you, you think it's on Earth. And, and it's a nod. It's a, it's a nod and a wink to Superman because this thing lands and there's a baby in it and you think, what? <laughs> and, but the baby's got powers. The eyes glow and these robots land. Oh, it's oh, literally, honestly, Chris, it's all kicking off in there. So you've got, you've got space robots. <laughs> you've got babies with glowing eyes. It's set in the future. You don't know where you are. It's got virtual reality. There, there's not a lot more they could have crammed into that first issue. Sounds great. Another, another bonkers, another bonkers one. On it, and it was, and it was Rick Remender that, that uh, and but Bengal's artwork, again, a, a nice, light, uh, European style. I think I, um, I'm pretty sure in one of my weekly reviews, I've done a deep dive on that. Because I think I had to flick. There is some some boobies. I think there's some nipples. There's some nipples in this one. But I had to flick over those pages. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure I've done a deep dive on that. Um, yeah, nice one. That was good. Cool. Probably enjoyed. Well, you sold it. me, and I'm now I got to go find space for robots and glowing eyes. That's uh, it. And nipples. Speaking with space, um, yeah. it should be no surprise. Uh, that I had to include a Matt Kent book. This is If You Find This, I'm Already Dead. Uh, issue number two. It is oversized. So oh, here's the size comparison. It's the oh, yeah. from his Flux House imprint uh, with Dark Horse, where he is just working with different artists and writing tales that he has wanted to write. And he's really playing with the medium um, of comics in general. He like... So I'm a huge Matt Kent fan. I'm wearing his mind management t-shirt. Um, again, whole shelf of his books. I have artwork and signatures of his on my walls. Um, I could gush over Matt Kent for days because I just think he's a freaking genius. Like he is working on levels that you and I can't even comprehend exist. And he's like comfortable there. Yeah. And his Everything that he does is so... It's just so well planned and executed and thought out. And even down to like the production of he wanted to have the magazine size books because he said that when he was going to shops, it was the time of like the Marvel graphic novels that were the magazine sized. Yes. Oh, those ones. Yes. The paper is like newsprint paper. It's not the glossy stuff. It's it's very matte. And so like it doesn't reflect the light even when it's hit directly on oh, it. It's a bit of a throwback. It's yeah, it, it feels very much like this book could have existed in the 80s. And it like so it it takes place, the whole premise is there is a pocket dimension with a portal that popped up in, in space just randomly one day. And then 90 years later, they only are sending the army through trying to get a stronghold so that they can learn about the tech and the uh, like terrestrial environment that is in this pocket dimension on this planet. But it's a highly uh, warring planet. Like the, the aliens are not welcoming to the humans at all. There's a language barrier. And so it's the first issue sets up uh, who, the, like, it sets up the planet. And then it is told from the perspective of the first non militant civilian to go through the portal. She's a member of the press. And it's her job to document what they're doing on that planet, what they've seen, what the military is going through every time they go through the portal. And so she's introducing the characters in, you know, just the narrator boxes, which I thought was a fun use of the narrator. Yeah. And then by the end of the first issue, uh, every other member of the military, it's on like page four, all of them die like right away. And so she <laughs> is then stranded on this warring planet with no way to get back to earth with no military training and she has to survive in the midst of all of these warring alien species that are unwelcoming to humans and so that's why it's called if you find this i'm already dead because the the ending page she's writing this letter of like either i lived 
and I brought this with me, or you found these pages on my corpse on this planet. Uh, and so it like it's a fascinating point of view for yeah. her to retroactively be telling the tale of what happened and how she's adapting. So issue two shows a lot of like how she's adapted to hiding amongst all of the aliens and disguising herself to not look human so that she can maneuver around and she's learning the language uh, of the aliens and she's trying to read and research and learn as much as she can and because of the language barrier she ends up in some not ideal situations but then she also has a, a crazy encounter with the planet itself which turns out is like sentient like ego of the planet yeah and it imbues her with knowledge of its history and then basically spits her out the other side. <laughs> and then, um, <clears throat> let me see, I had notes on this. There's so much that I could talk about it. Some of it, we were talking about like the throwaway issues where it's a lot of filler. This one feels like it could have had a little bit more filler because it does, the pacing is very quick. Right. I don't know if that's intentional because it's Matt Kinn, I question everything. Everything he does is so intentional that I'm like, okay, well, it, it, there's times that it feels like it's just moving very rapidly through. Well, and I don't know you, if that's... Well, you don't get a breather. You don't like yeah. holes. If yeah, there, there's no like... Leaves you breathless. Uh, okay. Yeah, and I, it, I mean, I was reading it quickly because it was just like one action step after another after and like oh no she's getting betrayed she's getting sacrificed to the planet the planet's talking to her she's out of the planet now who's she talking to what is she doing what is that giant guy where is she going why is she climbing that thing and so it's like all of that is happening and then you finally are like oh uh, what else is going to happen to her <laughs> and that's where issue two leaves you is like what more could she possibly go through? Like, is she just going to become the ruler of this planet because the planet communicated with her? Or is she going to be rescued? Like, are other humans even coming? What is happening? And so then I won't tell you the cliffhanger at the end of the first of the second issue because it's a really good one. Um, and it just, like, it's one of those things that was like, wait, what? I have so many questions now. And I just, I'm excited to see where else they go uh with this tale so oh that sounds brilliant yeah no, that, that's uh, that is a lot it's a lot for your sure. it sounds <laughs> a lot for your buck in one comment man that really that really does <laughs> yeah. um my next one up um well i don't know if it's back back down to earth but it's you know i'm going mainstream again aren't i with batman uh, now you mentioned too. Christian Ward. Yeah. This isn't his one, but he done a. I, I forget City what. City of Madness. Called. Yeah, City of Madness. Now, I think DC do a really, really nice job with with their Black Label mm -hmm. uh, books, and this the artwork in this where where it's like an Elseworlds tale, set just before the Second World War. And I, I just like that take on Batman. Yeah. That artwork, I think, is, you know, like the art deco design of the... And sometimes I roll my eyes at the... At all of the else, you know, they DC with Batman, I mean, but... but you know, you could, put, you could probably pick up 10 Batman books a month if you wanted to, or, or Batman related. That, but that one, got to admit, on the Black Label, the same as the City of Madness, it's just something different, especially with the Christian Wall one, to be fair. That was really over. Oh, yeah. And that got better and better, to be yeah. fair. Yep. It, it, it really did. And and that one, you could call it quite a a steady Eddie, just, you know, Batman in the, the late 30s when he was created, you know. Yep. But, but what they haven't done, which was pleasing, is they they haven't made it a year one. It's set in nineteen thirty nine, but he's already got the car and the gear, and Alfred's with it, you know, and Alfred's with him, and he's all set up. So yeah. it's not another year one, which I thought right. I enjoy. I, I thought that's good. That you know, tick, good. Yeah. I'll carry on. I'll turn the page, and 
the story that unraveled was a bit more it was it's pulpy it's like a pulp story from yeah. from you know from that era rather than just another elseworlds and because he's black label they're they're letting themselves relax a little bit into some of the harder elements of the storytelling and yeah and a good start a good recommendation yes. if you're into if you're into batman and you like a you like a one-off storyline because i i tend to up until recently actually I, I tended to just buy those you know the long halloween batman year one yeah it may be the the city of madness i would buy the one-offs and I think that'll make a nice one off. I think that they're, they're going to tell, who's the writer on that? Oh, Dan Jurgens. So blimey, if he can't tell a Batman story, <laughs> who, who can? So yeah, I, um, I also picked that one up. I saw it. Uh, it was one that, again, it's the oversized format. And I, I love the, they've got the that cover. They've got the image inside of the silhouette. Yes. Of Batman with the cape and with yes. the Art Deco logo, like yeah. all of it together. Yeah, just it's nice that I've done that. It it's not over complicated. No. But it's so well done. It's a really strong cover design. Yeah. And, and so that alone was like, all right, well, I'm a sucker for a good unique. And James Cagney. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just to set the tone. Just yeah. to just to get you right there. Yeah, that's your next one, Chris. So that was that was quite an easy, you know, breezy break. Yeah. Uh, so I have um, this is my cheat issue. <clears throat> I uh, you won't find this in comic shops yet. Uh, this was bad. This was a Kickstarter book that when I started the threads thing of like, hey, I'm just doing a new show about comics and music. Uh, Sebastian reached out to me and said, Hey, I've got a book and I've got a new publishing company. Uh, can I send you some stuff and let's chat? And I was like, uh, yeah, okay. And so he did. And so that, uh, it's, I'm going to show you the back cover. So it's goats flying press. <laughs> the tagline is, uh, comics against all odds, which I just love. Cause that's, that feels very punk. I'm, I'm never going to get this in England, am I? Probably not. Uh, unless you no probably not <laughs> uh, it's called the dead and the damned oh, it is, it's another oversized book it's just tall like it is so I... it's taller by about an inch and it's wider by about a half an inch but it's yeah. another square bound double size like prestige format yeah. uh Remember earlier when I said Kelly Williams is just great? Yeah. Kelly Williams is on this book too. And so when I got oh. it, I didn't know anything about what he was sending me. He was just like, oh, I'll send you our, our, the first issue of our book uh, and then you can read it and then we can chat. And I was like, okay. And so I got it and I was like, wait a second. I recognize that one. It is. It's Kelly Williams. And so I immediately uh. emailed him back like, yo, Kelly Williams, man. He was like, I know, right? He's so quiet. Um, so this is basically, it made me think of Army of Darkness, where there is a leader of an army of dead. And so he's raising all of these dead uh, skeletons and dead everything. And it, initially, he's got full control of the entire army. And then some magic happens, and he loses control to the point where his main like dead colonels get their memories back and so they remember it, you see like flash panels of yeah. how they died or what they were doing or their wives and then suddenly because they've gotten their memories back then they want to make their own decisions and so there's the tension between the like the colonels of the army of the dead and the leader while he's still recuperating and then there's also the struggle of the humans trying to take down the army of the dead and then they discover like well, we need to go at like they retreat after he loses control of the army and so then the humans are like well, we have to track him down and it's the son of the like 
human commander that's like, no, no, I'll, I'll go, I'll do it. And his dad's like, no, 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 I, I'll, I'll take care of it, son. You stay here. And and he's like, no, I have to do this. And so I think it's going to be kind of a coming of age tale. This first issue is very action battle scene heavy. So there's just skeletons fighting and heads getting lopped off and humans getting torn in half. But then there's also like beautiful full page, like double page spreads yeah. of, you know, the background and really showing off of what Kelly can do, um, which I just I just love. Like, it's so much fun to read because he he's another one that he manages to pack a ton of detail in without losing you as the reader. And yeah. so you still are like, oh, yeah, that's a skeleton guy with a sword shoved through his head. <laughs> like, got it. Yeah. Um, and it's it's just it's very monochromatic, too. He doesn't use the full color palette, which more often than not, I kind of find that I enjoy a lot. Like, I really like the simplified color palettes, because then when color is used, it feels more impactful. I see. And yeah. So that's uh, that, that's that's the. That's my ninth one uh, that you're probably never going to see. <laughs> that, that's a real shame, that. that um, but no, yeah, it's funny. Real good stuff. Um, you can do, uh, because I'll give it a plug, you can go to goatsflyingpress.com <laughs> and you might be able to order it there. Um, I don't know if you'll get the cool button that I got from Sebastian. I want, uh, Sebastian I want, if I can't get it, I want your one now, Chris. <laughs> well, uh, if you just Venmo me for the you low, low price me. of uh, twenty nine ninety nine over paid every three months, I will get it to you by next December. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, that looks that looks awesome. Yeah, yeah. Nice. It's I, I was pleasantly surprised because you never know when it's. I mean, the writer started the company to publish his own book which was just like that's yeah. like that's such a diy i love it uh also the guy that i uh, just recorded with carmen did the same thing where he was like i don't want to have to lose my ip like these are my characters i don't want to give up my at any of the rights to it or any of the anything like i'll just do it myself and so he just bootstrapped it and did it himself and that's exactly what sebastian did here too Nice. Which is got my support, hundred and ten percent. Yeah, and mine if I if I could, but no, I'll I'll find a way. I think I'll find a way to get that one. That looks really awesome. I mean, it's twenty twenty four. There's got to be a way. Yeah, you know, I've I've got connections. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So from completely independent to the man, just back to the man. Mm hmm. Again, another, I think a lot of people are, are falling off this one where I've fallen more in. Mm. I don't know whether I'm just, I just like being anti-establishment or what, but again, Jonathan, Jonathan Hickman and Valerio, and I did make a big hash of the review of this, Valerio Shitty. I did call it arse work instead of artwork in my review but it's Valerio Shitty's artwork there it is in this issue six this is one of the books you know I said earlier on Chris about you've got to get on with it mm -hmm. that's been the only thing with this book they've done a ten dollar I think it was a nine dollar ninety nine issue one of that I don't know if you picked it up or you was interested at all I didn't but it's kind of like the magic Marvel magic characters adjacent. So you've got Doctor Strange and all the rest of them, blah, blah, blah. So th this is set up, you know, Jonathan Hickman has set up, as he does, he sets up his whole, his whole a whole new world over there, yeah. a whole new thing. Then he's done that, which I do think was a bit extra. I think if he'd, again, I think if, if an editor had just went, oh, John, mate, just calm down. <laughs> We have we, a huge world. <laughs> yeah, you don't need all that. You've, you've got some good shit here. So just give us these stories. Because I think this is only going to be eight issues. Mm. Which is nice because it's Jonathan Hickman and, and Valerio Shitty on the artwork. His artwork on this, where they've gone into more of a, fan, a fantasy realm with this. 
and it was it, it's almost like a um the seven levels of hell that one of the main characters has to go through so you've got you've got the boatman and you've got the the keepers of the uh the, the towers and all etc etc the artwork in it is, is so beautiful and it's almost like a one shot it's almost like a I don't want to say filler because that makes it seem like a throwaway, like a self-contained. It's almost like a self-contained story, but it's a character that has been in the previous issues. But this is all about her going on a and there's a and there's a twist at the end, which was really nice. This horrific twist at the end where obviously she has to make these promises to each keeper that she meets at the the gate of each level asks her to make a sacrifice. You either do this or do that. Mm. And each decision, and this is where Jonathan Hickman's intelligence and his storytelling ability shines without being overcomplicated because you get right from the start because one of the other, other characters says, bear in mind, you'll be asked to make these decisions again. It, mm. it, it flows really nicely and I think, no, I, I'll say that when these eight issues are all out and they will obviously collect it, that that will make a lot more sense. Mm. And I think Hickman's writing, lent, definitely, he, he's in the top three writers where probably a monthly format doesn't suit his writing at all. Yeah. I think he's in nothing wrong with that. I suppose in this modern world, I, I, I just think Hickman sees the big picture, and he's he's giving you, but he's not even giving you chapters in each issue. I think he sometimes his chapters, if this makes any sense, his chapters might be two or three issues, yeah, and that would be chapter one. Yep. So it's not even working on a monthly level. Yeah, and I think that's why a lot of people are moaning about gods. But I've kind of gone the other way. I was whinging a bit at the beginning, thinking, oh, my God, we didn't need that $10. We really didn't. It was like that. Um, but it has come true. And hopefully Marvel don't charge $100 for it. <laughs> hopefully. That will make. But I, I, really, I was really impressed with that as a comic. Yeah. As Writer, artist, story, beautiful. I was really impressed with that. Cool. I've I've heard, I have heard very mixed about that series, mm. and I've heard enough mixture of it and like why people are like, ah, oh, it just is dragging. It's just yeah, uh. get on with it. Yeah. And it's like, well, I'm a patient reader, so if it goes somewhere that you know, if the denouement, how's that for a word? If if the the climax of everything pays off all of that, like then it's worth it for me to an extent, especially if I can like find it on my local library. <laughs> so, oh, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Read it for free. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, just yeah. But yeah, yeah. It's 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 on my radar at least to give it a go, uh, to give it the old college try. But because it it's already at that's what issue five. Of that, six? That's issue six of eight. Oh, six of eight. Okay, yeah. And when yeah, the then trade, even more reason to wait. Um, yeah, and when the trade comes out, Chris, it will still be head and head and show, as much as it's polarizing opinion. It's just for Marvel. It is still head and shoulders above seventy percent of what they put out. Mm. So as much as people yeah. moan about it, it's still it, that would be a good read. Yeah. But better off in that format, I think. Great. Well, you know what we're down to, right? Go on. What are we down to? <gasps> dun, dun, dun. Da, da, da. Come on, on, runner. You kick it off. I, uh, so Ram V is a writer that I know the name and I know I've read plenty by him, but if, I were like, oh yeah, Ram V. He wrote. Uh... <laughs> He's that for me. Yes. But then when I pick up a book, so I've 
I'm super nerdy. I have lists. I have a spreadsheet of every book that I've read for the past like five years. Shut and up. That's too good. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Sure That's... do. Um, <laughs> Cause I saw all the people like my 500 comics goal. And I was like, how much do I actually read in a year? And so I tracked it. And um, it turns out I read more than 500 issues a year, but I, and I end up recognizing a lot of names because I write down the title, the issue number, the off, the writer, and the artist. And so if I really wanted to get nerdy, which I haven't yet, uh, I could put together like pivot tables of, you know, quantifying who has written what. And I feel like Ram V would have a high number of things that I've read that he's written even though I don't ever like, oh, Ram V, I got to search that out and find it. Like I do with Matt Kent and Jeff Lemire and Christian yeah, Ward. And yeah. That said, this first issue was excellent. Yeah. Uh, uh, like it feels very Pacific Rim. That's it. Which, That's the which one. Is, is good for me because yeah. I loved Pacific Rim. <laughs> I love Kaiju. I love Giant Mech. Uh, you know, I loved Voltron as a kid. And so seeing a new take on that, because um, it 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 was familiar, but it also did still feel very fresh to me. And so, like, I think that's why I enjoyed it. There were a couple panels that I had that I might have lost track of what was actually happening with the mech battle um, because it was so detailed that I was like, I don't really know what I'm looking at. But I was able to gloss past that and just step back and be like, no, this is just a giant freaking battle. Like, it's a giant mech fight a, battling a giant alien, and that's just cool as shit. Like, that's just super cool. Um, And so, but that said, like, I'm going to wait for the trade because they already announced they're going to do a hardcover collection of this. Yeah. And I'm a sucker for a good hardcover. And so I'm going to wait and I want to read it all together because I feel like it's not just a tale of a giant robot. Like giant no, I, don't, I don't think it will be. No, I don't. I'm, I'm with you. I don't yeah. think it will be. And I thought the artwork, even Cagle's artwork, and he's the guy who does the uh, covers on Detective Comics. Okay at the moment and they are beautiful covers and it, actually the artwork in detective comics is is also not by him but also beautiful and there is this and again i don't know i'll have to quantify why i keep calling it a european style i think it's a non i think i think what i'm getting at if i'm thinking out loud now it's a non superhero it's a non it's a more humanist style it's not and it isn't over stylized and i think it's back to the mobius you know the jean giro um, yep. mobius days where he had he had a style that was iconic yep but it, it's that one i'm saying that even cagle i i'm loving that stuff and um Oh, what's her name? Eve Lee, Bill Quist, whatever her name is, on um, uh, Hel uh, Bill Quist, Eve Lee, on that Helen of Windhorn. Yep. That, that Europe, she's got a, um, yeah, that certain style, Napalm Lullaby, uh, by that, uh, Bengal, whether that's a man or woman, I don't know. But there does seem to be, which I'm enjoying, there's that kind of european style of artwork in a lot of these books now and also that manga ish yeah style that seems to be seeping through so yeah. which is obviously people's uh influences yeah oh, yeah Arts influences yeah. seeping through of where they've been where they've come from what they've read what they what they want to draw yeah basically but that that dawn runner i was that is properly my cup of tea that that my kind of sci-fi yeah the action as well yep and uh, I, for yeah. me like the best sci-fi is told in a sci-fi setting but it's still very real it's the this yeah. still feels very real mm. even though they're fighting giant aliens with yes. giant robots yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah definitely any any story like you said right at the beginning 
um, about one of the uh, the other books, the horror the horror books set in mm, yeah. you know Skeeters, yep. In in, in the the town, in small town, yeah. In small, yes, having it, a seafood festival. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and you can identify with him, her, there, that. Yep. Um. Yeah. It's got, to, but that that for me actually, if I was going to sum up a book of the month because these are all from, I reckon that could be. What would be your book of the month, Chris? I think for me, out of all the ones we've been talking about, a close runner-up would be Helen of Windle. My top three would be Helen, Napalm, and it's got. I think Dong Runner. That would be that would be my top three, but definitely Dawn Runner. I I think that's my book of the month. That's fair. I if I had to just ugh, um thinking about like what was super fun to read, but also because you did a top three, so I'm gonna, I'm really good with lists. Um, yeah. Oh, here you go. You're going to get a spreadsheet out now, aren't you? I'm probably going to, yeah. Tempt me with a good time, right? Well, you're going to create one. <laughs> I'll, I'll do some, I'll type out some uh, Excel equations and really get fancy. I'll create oh, on a 10 oh. point scale and taking the means and averages. Ooh, tell me all excited more. Already. Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think my top three. Yeah. I would have bloodshot in there. Yep. Uh, just this is a true return to form for bloodshot. Cool. It feels very. He's just trying to figure out what where his place is in the world without being someone else's weapon. Yep. And I feel like those are the best. Lemire's run on bloodshot was just top tier because of his character work. Like he really developed uh, bloodshot into somebody that you were like, yeah. And so it, it's good to see him return. No, he did. I didn't know Jeff Lemire had bloodshot. Yeah. No. Yeah. Was that in his early days? Uh, Lemire's? It, it was like earlier. It was before he worked at DC. He had only done a couple books that he put out himself. And then before it was after Essex County had come out, like that was the one that put him on the map. Yeah. Um, and it was after that, but then I think it was before he did Sweet Tooth, and like it was before any of that happened. So yeah. it was in. And so again, that was I'm his, sure yeah, somebody his, can. His formative, his formative. Yeah, yeah. yeah nice. but it's definitely like it. It's really a pure Jeff Lemire book because he's such a character-driven writer, and he writes characters really, really well. And he understood Bloodshot and gave him all sorts of new layers that are still being referenced, used, explored. All at, like a lot of it comes from a Lemire's run, wow. which is just foundational. Um, so that's that's one of them. Uh, just because it's, I mean, it scratches that itch for me. Uh, I will say, yeah, Bogotha, I thought that might be there. Yeah, I don't blame yep. you. Yeah. Yep, because it was. I went in based on the cover, expecting one thing it gave me something else and then it started to give me what I expected. And right. so like the roller coaster of reading it was just, <laughs> it was just fun. Uh, it was fun to read. And I would probably agree with you that Don runner is the third in my top three. I'm not going to say that I have a favorite um, because of the three, it's tough for me to say one. It, it might be bloodshot, but that's because of my history with the character. Yeah, like I've got, that is that, isn't it? For you, it was. Yeah. yeah you know, it, it was. I mean, I've got a long box of nothing but '90s Valiant and all of the new Bloodshot stuff that they put out. Like, I think I've got all the Bloodshot books that have been published. <laughs> like, period. Um, you should say so. I'm the creator of Bloodshot. I've got a signed. I've got one. I have got one Bloodshot comic. Yeah. And it is by. The creator of Bloodshot, who I met at Baltimore Comic Con, uh, not last year, the year before. Okay. Because he was um, part of a new comic company called Visi, Visi, Visi 8, and they had a stand. Hmm. And I, I did do a video on him. 
when after I'd met them and promoting their line and all the rest of it, I don't know where they've gone with everything. They did produce a few. His his book was called Changeling. Um, I remember hearing that title. Yeah, and they was they was they was based out in Singapore or Thailand or somewhere. But uh, I kept going back to their stand over the course of the convention. You know, I was in Baltimore for three yeah for three days I think, and. Um, and yeah, he just gave me a, a, he said, here you go. He gave me a signed copy of Bloodshot. Nice. And that is the only comic I ever got of it. Because I, I said to him, I said, I think it, I like Barry Windsor Smith. So I got, uh, yeah. what was it? Solar, Man of the Atom. And what was yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. What was he one? did, uh, Windsor Smith did work on EXO. Um, yeah. Did he do some of the oh, Vinjack stuff in- too? Oh, I, I wasn't into that. To be, yeah, I I wasn't a valiant boy. All right, that's fair. I so I, uh, (laughs) I'm only a valiant person because my mom was trying to compete with my dad. So my parents were split at like fourth grade. I used to go to the comic shop with my dad, and he would let me pick out whatever. Um, So I was picking out like Wolverine and Savage Dragon, and actually, you probably can't see it, but this issue here of Wolverine uh is part of larry hama's run and it was the first book that i picked out for myself and i was just like that cover he's got the bone claws and they've broken and it just has the giant wolverine but and he's on his knee and it's just such like a striking cover and so i got to meet larry hama at cincinnati comic-con last year two years ago two years ago um same year i met chris claremont and I met Claremont, had him sign my Wolverine number one, cool. is obviously. And then I went to Larry Hama and like no one was at his table. And I was just like, hey, I, man, you're running Wolverine. Like, this is the first book that my dad let me pick out for me, like of anything. He just said, yeah, I'll just buy whatever, like just pick out whatever you want. And I had free reign and this is the book that I picked up. And so thank you for like, writing stories that kept my dad and I going back to the comic shops so that I could continue yeah, buying nice. those runs. And he was like, oh, that's such, like, he, you know, you could tell that he valued hearing that and was like, he was super humble about the whole thing. Um, but so while my dad was taking me to the shop to buy Marvel books, my mom didn't want to directly compete by taking me to comic shops. She instead would take me with like, there's an old mall and there's like a dollar store or something in there. And they used to have like in the bags, three comics for a dollar. And they were always valiant because they were just three comics for a dollar. And so that's how I fell in love with like Ninjak, Shadow Man, Bloodshot as a kid, because I was getting all of those books. And then now as an adult, I'm like, well, like the book that got me back into comics as an adult was when Valiant relaunched uh, in like 2008, 2009, somewhere in there. Yeah. Again, that's probably wrong because um, I don't remember any years ever. <laughs> Matt Kent wrote uh, Rye for Valiant with Clayton Crane doing the artwork. Oh, wow. And Rye, Rye number one was the book that got me back into comics and so like when i met matt kent i told him that i was like will you i know it's not one of your original characters but like will you sign this book for me like that this is the reason i got back into comics as an adult and he was like absolutely like yeah that's so cool and so he signed my hands up it's very cool and i love i love those memories though yeah i love those memories like the fact that larry hammer would remit like would be like a little bit emotional over the fact that that memory for you yeah i love that look look look, 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 you know over a comic yeah you won't you you won't hear many stories like look but that was a comic you fell in love with and yep buying those packs of three valiant i mean i'm sure i've got more but because i'm sure like when you just said right not that i i've got any of those but when you mentioned shadow man earlier on I can see the covers now with him with the with the glasses and that, and I'm sure that was Ashley Wood. I'll I'll be rummaging around tomorrow now. Uh, <laughs> I'll just pull out my Valiant long box. And how much time you got? I know it's like mid- yeah, midnight for you. Long but box you wanna... 
<laughs> I'll just pull my Valiant long box and we can just go right now, right? <laughs> Have a whole separate episode of I, nothing but yeah. Valiant. <laughs> right to Z. <laughs> anyway, that was Chris. Thank you so much. That was a great. I suppose we'd better wrap it up at about two hours. Yeah, we're you we're normally I do this stuff in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I have the gift of gab. Yeah. Oh, look, me. That, yes. <laughs> man, man after my own heart. <laughs> <laughs> now that was a little that was a brilliant roundup of um well I say roundup, it wasn't really, it was just their top their favourites of March. So yeah. and I think we that was a good I think anyone watching, if anyone still is by now, <laughs> <laughs> I think that was what you would call an eclectic collection. I think we, I think we covered everything from superhero to horror to fantasy to sci-fi. Yep. I think we covered Action, everything. slice of life, yeah, it's all there. Indie, everything, mate. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank, Thanks for having thank me. For that. And I wish you all the best of luck with everything. I'm, I'm sure we're going to get together uh, again, oh, but yeah. in the meanwhile, yeah. best of luck with. Everything going on because you, you know, long box punk is is new. Yep. So yep. still trying to figure out like how what the routine's gonna be. I had, I had a, an explosion of a lot of stuff all up front, and now yep. as it's starting to kind of dwindle a little bit, uh, now is when I think the real work is gonna come in of finding yep. guests and what do I do if I don't have a guest and uh, what's that gonna look like? So yeah it's it's fun like that for me is the fun part all that planning yeah, will, and thinking and yeah. that's like this this for me i mean it's a new thing you know it was it was joe last month you this month next month might get the two of you back maybe or you know or we just do five each so we only waffle on for three hours <laughs> <laughs> i'll do two issues that's it that's, that's I'll it. Keep myself to two <laughs> Just, I'm, still be three hours long even if <laughs> book of the month here it is <laughs> we wouldn't be able to do it we wouldn't be able to do it. Nope. it takes a month just trying to decide yep. so, uh, listen uh chris thank you so much mate uh, absolutely that was a great that was a great selection and well like i say best of luck and until next time Adios. Buongiorno. <laughs> <laughs>